We're live. Okay, I guess we're live. So welcome everybody to another uh, eventide, quarantide, I guess one would say, a chat with uh, some of my friends, some expert experienced mixers. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves a little bit? I'm William Whitman, probably best known for work with Cindy Lauper, Joan Osborne, The Fix, The Outfield, and so on. And with us today, we have J.J. Blair, Brad Divins, and Dave Darlington. Thanks, guys, for being here. Pleasure to be here, Bill. Thanks for inviting us. So, Dave, since you spoke first, tell us a bit about you. And uh, I started engineering in the mid-'80s in uh, Manhattan and worked my way up the food chain and um, just been hanging in there for a really long time, trying to learn as I earn. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. And Brad? Uh, I'm currently the front of house engineer for Enrique Iglesias, uh, started as a musician and made the transition into mixing front of house. Now I have a studio in my house as well called Fixing to Get Mixing, which is coming quite handy right now while we're all quarantined since we have a lot of shows yeah. to mix. I find myself in here tracking and mixing and that's kind of my story. JJ? Uh, I'm a, uh, producer, engineer, Musician. I think I started really doing this professionally in in '95, and have been doing it ever since. Um, and really, I'm a, I'm a musician who feels the studio is is my favorite uh, instrument. Uh, and um, yeah, I just you know it's 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 kind of like where the art and the science come together, and and I and I just love making records, and and uh, and you know I'll I'll put up with a bunch of nonsense uh, just to do what I love. <laughs> I, I think that's it. I think that goes for all of us. That's a good yeah. way to good way to describe it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think all of us and a lot of people in the in the recording biz backdoored into it by being musicians first. I know I was just the guy in the band who was the most interested in what was going on in the control room, or other people were not. So right. it's right. just yeah. sort of how it happens. You get the bug, I guess. Well, my yeah. my dad was, you know, what they called back then. I think they called it a stereo file before they called it an audio file. And I was always playing with his real. You know, I learned to splice as a kid mm -hmm. and do all those things. So mm -hmm. you know, that the whole recording stuff had always interested me from when I was a kid. So it it all just I was fine. Oh, I can do all these things together. It's how, yeah. how awesome is that? Yeah, exactly. Plus, engineers get all the chicks. If you didn't know, <laughs> <laughs> and all the applause. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was always the guy in the band when we were in studios making records. I was the guy who would be sitting there the whole time with the engineer and producer. And exactly. Right. I would be there from the beginning of the day until we left at midnight. Yep. Trying morning. to pick his brain. Yep. Yep. Yeah, me too. And I, and I know I said, you know, can I come back and watch? Can I hang out and see other sessions? And sure, just sure. wormed my way into it. Mm -hmm. Of course, in my case, that was, you know, between the world wars when it was a lot simpler. Yeah. It can <laughs> but, still be simple. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. So, yeah. so at least as a jumping off point, I thought we'd talk about all of us are guys who you might call, I don't know, analog guys, or at least started there, started on big consoles and, and, and working with analog gear and now find ourselves at least a good portion of the time, if not all the time, mixing what they call in the box. I thought we could talk about that and see what we might have to share with people that since so many people are only working that way, that let's hope we have something to share that's useful to people. And also, I want to know what you guys think anyway. You know, it's sometimes this is such an isolated activity that I know the way I do things, but I'm often kind of amazed to, to find out, oh, you do it that way? It's like it never would have occurred to me. And it's interesting at the very least. So let's start off with what, what DAW do you guys tend to work in? I'm, I'm a Pro Tools guy, I'll just say, but... Yeah, I'm exclusively Pro Tools. Pretty yeah, much. we're all Pro Tools guys. But everybody, yeah. And is there a reason? In my case, it was just because when I first got dragged kicking and screaming into that world, um, it was everybody I knew was working in that. I mean, that's still what... I never get a call, can you come to some place and record in Logic over in, yeah. in Cubase? It's just, it just is ubiquitous. So that was the reason for me. And also, it, re it represents to us the studio. You have only two windows, really. You have the yeah. board, and you have the score or the tape or the tracks. I'll be yeah. 
Well, I guess there is a, there is a MIDI window, but you're right. You're right. It's it came more from a representation of the world. It looks like a console. It looks more like what we're used to. I think. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, I have. There's Just one artist. To... There's one artist I do some work with who is, you know, he uses Logic with. To my chagrin, not that there's anything wrong with Logic. I'm just I'm so fast at Pro Tools, and I right, sit around and I'm stumbling, and that's that's part of the thing. Because for me, part of being a good engineer is being fast and being completely unobtrusive to the process. Transparent. Yes, and 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 I and I and I know I can be really fast on Pro Tools, not slow down the session, and and on top of it, it's I need to be able to uh, hand things back. You know, it's like it's like when when you were doing stuff on ADAT, but you had to go somewhere that was 24 mm. tracks. Mm -hmm. So if everyone has a two inch 24 machine, then you can go from one place to the next. Yeah. Right. And so it's be, sort of become the standard, at least in, in the, the professional, uh, you know, recording. Yeah, people get upset when you say that, but it's essentially true. Yeah. It is the standard for better or for worse. I mean, I don't have a problem with it. So, you know, I'm, I'm only saying that to cover the people who don't like it. But yeah, yeah it seems to be the thing that's the thing in the pro world. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure there were better uh, formats than two inch 24 sound wise, but that was the standard. So that that's, you know, you can't fight City Hall. Yeah, yeah. I think th I seem to remember there was a little kerfuffle at some point that um, I think Telefunken released a two-inch machine where the head spacing was slightly different and they were saying oh this is better and people were saying yeah but if i put my tape up on another machine it's going to erase your it was it's like you know you know that right. joke, the thing about standards is there's so many of them. <laughs> well the thing about pro tools too is a very expensive entry level you know other than that free version which doesn't really is ridiculous much. yes but you know for 200 bucks anybody can buy logic i mean there's there's people all over the world right now making a beat in Logic, but not not everybody can really afford a, a real Pro Tools system. Yeah, yeah, that is definitely true. And I guess I guess the people who work super in MIDI on that end of the the, the scoring guys and and the yeah yeah. They, uh, although you're pretty deep in the post world too, in the TV world, Dave. So, well, but that, I think a lot of the guys who are super MIDI don't like Pro Tools as a first yeah. choice. A lot of the post is in performer because the ruler is so plastic. Yeah. You can stretch it around to fit the picture as you like. But in Pro Tools, you know, the, the video comes up in Pro Tools. You watch it and mix yeah. it while you're watching the picture and off you go. Yeah. I don't know. For me, do you know the there's the Sherlock Holmes quote that actually turned out to be true when they did PET scans of people's brains that he said, um, I forgot what it is, but w Watson says something to him about uh, the solar system, and he's and he's amazed that Holmes doesn't know anything about it. And he said, "Well, what use is it to me if I had to learn that? I'd have to forget something to make room <laughs> for that that is actually important." And it turns out that really is the way our brains work. I probably yeah. I don't have room to learn another DAW. I'm not smart enough to know more than one at a time. I'd have to forget <laughs> something. Right. <laughs> so. What do you guys find? Is there something you find specifically different about working in the box versus working on a desk? Do you find you do, for example, more or less processing? Do you tend to EQ more, compress more, other kinds of treatment? Any, what's, what strikes you as I'll, different I'll, in the way I'll you think about it? I'll jump on this because I have a whole thing about this, if you guys don't mind. Well, and this goes back to, I remember when the Neve Capricorn came out. And and uh, guy, my mentor, we did a mix on that, and then we and, and we did a mix on the regular console, and the Capricorn mix sounded nice, but it was just boring, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, I don't even get into like the the digital analog thing in terms of like what sounds better or you know what's damaging the sound. For me, it was just in terms of character, and digital on its own can just sound really boring. One of the things that we like about analog is what's wrong with it. We've just gotten used to that. You know, we've gotten used to the crosstalk, we've gotten used to the distortion, we've gotten used to mm -hmm. all sorts of limitations of it. Uh, and, um, and so when I started mixing in the box, I hated it. I hated the way my mixes sound. And the reason I hated it was because I was just trying to replicate the way I did it on an analog console, mm -hmm. which was not much. Right. right, which is which is natural. That's how you would think. That's how I would think to start too. And well, and, yeah. I, and and because of the way things are, because you know, I'm working with an artist right now. We had to do 23 revisions of a mix. Imagine doing 23 analog recalls. Right. right? Huh. 
Um, I am so <laughs> glad. I am so glad I work in the box because I I hit one button and I have instant recall, and uh, it was, you know, what I, I just have to do a lot more processing, which is fine because I I can have like you know ten LA two ways. But that's right? two different things. That's two different things. Leaving aside the recallability, which is of course a the primary reason I think we all are in the box right, these but, days. But, 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 I, but, but I, I'm I, saying you do find you do a lot more in in the DAW world than I, in the analog world. Yeah, and I, and I have to do more processing and get it in, in order to get it to for, or for me to feel like it sounds like my analog mix. Yeah, like I have to put schmutz on it. And I was my friend friend <laughs> Saluter. We were talking about. He said in the '90s, in '80s and '90s, everyone was trying to get more separation in the in the sounds, and now we're trying to get more glue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's really the truth. You know, before on tape, you had to brighten things up so they could be crisp and clear. And now it's the opposite. Now you're looking for the saturation plugins and the drive stuff to, to give it some gumption before you even start to mix. But one of the problems with having, you know, an LA-2A on every track, sometimes you get mixes from clients who have a little, a little bit of dangerous knowledge and the, the plugin <laughs> stack is humongous. And, and you, you know, you you press play and their mix is just not happening. And then you start turning stuff off and suddenly yeah. it's sounding a lot better. I mean, that's what you really, I remember older engineers telling me, Dave, you should, you should be able to get a rough mix with one delay and one reverb. I was like, no, oh, man, we have all this stuff. We can use all this stuff. <laughs> Dave, one delay, one reverb. You should make it sound like a record. And you know what? They were right. Should be one delay or one reverb. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> or the delay feeds the reverb. That's okay, the right, right. You know, I still tend to find myself starting out with the less is more approach, though. Yeah, being, being in digital because, I mean, I spend a lot most of my time mixing live shows, and my approach there has always been, what do I need to mix the show? Yeah, it'd be nice. But that's why I love you in front of house because it's not like the Brad show. It's like, how do I just make this sound great? Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's that's what my job is, is to make what's coming off stage sound great. And I should be able to do that with anything that is put in front of me. Yeah. So coming right. from that approach, less is more, going into the digital world, even though I can have, like you say, an LA2A on every channel, I don't find the need for that because I'm looking to make everything – I want all that distortion. I want all that harmonic, you know, stuff that's going on, but I'm still looking for the imaging and the, and some sure. kind of separation. Right. And then get the field nice and big and wide and, and powerful with his. Well, let me, let me, little... let me clarify one thing before I get misunderstood. When I, the reason I picked an LA 2A was not necessarily for the compression. It's for the color. The color. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've gotten stuff where it's like, there's eight plugins on a kick drum and I'm like, yeah. really? Exactly. Maybe the yeah. kick drum didn't sound very good. Yeah. And that's that, right. But that, that's very much a trend. Like uh, I see people's trend. tutorials that, that say, I, I don't take all, I don't just adjust the first compressor. If I don't get what I want, I just add another compressor. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but, but having said that, um, I think it's two different things, at least in my mind, I'm totally with you guys that I am in comparison to most mixes I'm get sent or see, I don't have a lot of stuff going on. I'm a, definitely a less going on guy. But I'm coming back to, I remember in the very early days where you talk about the Capricorner, but when, when Sterling first got that digital, I forgot what the Neve digital desk was that started to appear in people's rooms for mastering. I remember George Marino saying he felt he had to do six times as much, like where one dB on the Sontech would do it. If he was EQing in the digital world, it was six dB, eight dB. That right. just to get the same effect, he had to do that much more. And I do find it's not as bad as I think it used to be, but I, I think I do find that somewhat, oh, I'm ringing and I'll ignore it, sorry. I do find that somewhat in the box in general that, that to get the same thing that I expect to get from a real LA-2A, I have to hit right. the in-the-box LA-2A a lot harder. I've got to make it do a lot more. And certainly with EQ, I, I, I look at my numbers sometimes and go, I, I better not look at it or I wouldn't. <laughs> and I'm not shy with EQ on an analog desk either, but no. but there's I, but I'm still doing a lot more in the box than I think I would be doing on an analog world. I think part of that too is just, from my understanding, talking to programmers, distortion is one of the more difficult things to model correctly yeah. and it's expensive in terms of dsp yeah, yeah. right so, interesting I, I find i find most I was told. 
I could be wrong. I, I th- it makes sense. I mean, I, I, coming back to something Dave said, I mean, I do feel like there are some plugins that respond well to being pushed or hit hard or driven. Quite a lot of them, the more you do, the smaller everything starts yes. to yes. get. And, and that's the scary bit. If you're not careful, if you're not tuned into listening to that, it's easy to go, oh, yeah, I added the LA2 because that's what so-and-so uses on his guitar and not be paying attention to the fact that it just made your guitar sound smaller. Well, right, right. this is which is one of the one of the main problems with the thing. One of the things I don't like about digital is analog. Depending on what it is, if you abuse the headroom, it can sound really cool. Digital yeah. almost never sounds good when you abuse no. the headroom, and that's why you know I always say uh, uh, orange is the new red. Yeah. So, well, see, I, I would you, say I would. Yeah, I, I say in the green. I don't even want to go near the middle okay. of the range. I, my levels are very, very conservative. I, I, I just, I, I, I just feel like I, the more headroom, the, head, the you can always add distortion on purpose, yeah, but yeah. but getting it by clipping the mixer is yeah, not yeah, the way to get it. Digital Phil, you don't want to have all those unused bits. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, you guys, you guys all remember putting the index cards over the VU meters, right? Like. <laughs> on the consoles you don't don't look at it listen to it right? listen, to, listen to the meter hitting the pen especially the summing <laughs> bus you could you could kill on the ssls and on the neves you could ram it and it sounded great but not in digital yeah and i guess there are plugins that at least are claiming they're designed to be able to do that and some of them sound okay pushed but in general i'm just saying it should be because you've decided you want distortion not just because the louder i push everything the better it is usually it's the opposite yeah right Everybody's agreeing. That's no yeah, fun. We all agree. <laughs> no, well, I get I no. get stuff from clients what where they're, rules? Just they're gaining up the on music. one plugin, and the very next plugin they're gaining it back down. So the, yeah, the exactly. Game stru- is, they're not really using the plugins; they're just using them to add and subtract the gain. And that's what well, and they're not. And, it, you, and if you're clipping one of those plugins, you're not getting rid of that by turning it down to the next exactly, one. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I'll say there, I'm not going to mention who it is because I, I like the band and I like the record, you know, and I like the producers. But there was a record that came out, I don't know, about 10, 12 years ago that I just was such a fan of in terms of the production and the songs. But there was just it, it was hard for me to listen to. And, 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 and I talked to the person who mastered it and he was like, yeah, no, I thought it was the mastering guy's fault. And he said, no, no, that was how I got that. And apparently mm-hmm. these producers liked the sound of when they pushed the plugins really hard. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, maybe it's not so much that our ears are better than, but we, than other people's, but we, this is what we do. And we, we notice things that other people don't notice. And right. I was just noticing that sound over and over and it made it really hard to listen to. And, and, and well, that's what I always try to in, in, implore to people. It's just like, yeah. walk in the headroom. there's no noise floor. You don't have to be loud. Exactly. There's no reason to cream it. You're not, you're not gaining anything. No right. pun intended. But um, it, it, this is also, I always say people get addicted to the sound of an L2 or an L1 on there, uh, you know, that, that distortion that the limiter is creating is part of what they, some people like about it. I personally hate that sound, yeah. but it's not just that your record's louder. It's that they like that clipping, especially what happens on the bottom end, that, 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 that hardness of it is. It's a it's square, hard. it's a square wave. But they get, atta- they get attached to that. Like that's, you know, maybe I'm just a fuddy duddy, but I mean, that's not a, that's not a sound I find appealing. No, it's exactly. not I just, I just went through, sorry, right. Right, I don't want to cut you off because I've, okay. I've been hogging this. Go ahead. And no, I'll... it's just, I, I agree with Bill. It's like there's artifacts that are added with certain limiters and I can't, I can't, I mean, I can listen to 60s music and 70s music, which to me sounds amazing. But it sounds amazing because the songs are good. Yeah. You know, nowadays it's just make make my record as loud as you can make it. It doesn't matter if it's if it's yeah. dynamically the same from start to finish. I just want it loud and yeah. crunchy. And I just I, went through this last week with an artist. They sent the the uh, mix off to a very famous mastering guy who uh, when I got it back, you know, everything looked like this. And and yeah. I I had to do I think seven and a half dB of limiting to equal how loud he made it. Yeah. And all the dynamics were gone. So what I did was I brought it back down to equal RMS and sent both versions back to the artist and said, I yeah. know this sounds better to you, but now listen to them at equal power. Right. And, tell me. and it didn't sound better. You know, right. it sounded, they were like, oh man, we lost all the dynamics. I'm like, 
Well, uh, but again, the good news is that they agreed that they heard it. It's conceivable, as I said, people people get attached to having the limiter on all their rough mixes, and then they well, you take it off and they're like right. out. It's like I never. That's why I never do that. It's like I say, you're going to have to turn it up. It's not going to be loud. I'm not doing anything to make it loud. But that's the volume sounding better to them. That's not. You know, no, I don't think so. I think in a lot of cases they get used to the sound of the L2. It's like that's that's a whole different thing than just the volume. Is there other tricks good mastering guys do to make things loud? Yeah. yeah. So but let's sometimes make, sometimes ahead, you get rough, you get rough mixes from other people who cut the record before you mix it, so they're used to the rough mix yep. that they yep. created. Yep. And, you know, if you, if you try to explain, well, it's going to go to mastering later. Yep. You know, you sometimes you have to print two, you know, one for the mastering engineer and one for the client. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a constant battle, by the if, way. If you're in a mix battle, if you know you're you're going up against some guy with three letters and you're going to have to come, who's going to get the mix? Yes. You've got to make it loud because you know the loudest mixes, the loudest, brightest one's going to win. Right. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm just talking about on my own project, sort of start to finish. I never, I never let anybody take home limited rough mixes or any of that. It's like, turn it up. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. You'll enjoy it more. I would hope. So <laughs> moving on a bit, how about um, console emulation? Um, I wrote an article recently uh, for a production expert, Pro Tools expert, about um, sort of setting up your workflow to be more analog console-like. Like, for example, populating all the channels with the same EQ and maybe the same compressor, even if you're bypassing it, having all yeah. your rev sends and your delay sends set so that in the middle of a project, you're not saying, oh, I've got to set up the reverb send on this. It's just there. You click it on the way you'd click it on on a console. Yeah. You guys think along those lines and and also do you do anything in terms of console analog emulation plugins actual you know like uh, vcc or or uh, nls or any of those sort of somebody go yeah i do oh, just VCC. a big no for you jj yeah big no. okay brad yeah i do use vcc on a couple of things uh-huh just on a couple of things though. i think i think maybe one is on you know, the very beginning of my drum group, and then it's on the master bus. At right. That point, just for a little bit of color. But uh, when I first started mixing in a box, I tended to be like, okay, I want all my drums to be Neve, and I want my guitars to be SSL, and like, because I could. Yeah. And now I find myself, oh, I like this Focusrite channel strip. Let's put it on like I'm mixing on a Focusrite. Exactly. And now... That's my workflow now. Whether it's a focus right or an SSL strip, it's going to be across, you know, seventy-five to eighty percent of the mm -hmm. mix, because that's I like that sound mm -hmm. of what that's doing. I don't find the need now to go to different things. Yeah. Right, and and who was who was it who said these days it's not so much about separating; it's about how do I make it all glue together? Is that you, Dave? Right. And, yeah, they, and, they don't call it separating. They well, call it well but again, I, I'm a big arguer for you should be recording everything through one mic pre. This this whole I, I like this I like the API and the guitar and the Neve on the drums is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It's like record it like it was a console. Got, got everything should be the same. Oh, yeah. But the, but the same thing in mixing, what Brad is saying, I think it's a good idea to say whatever, whatever EQ is in favor with me at the moment is going on every channel until I have a reason to patch in the pull tech or the equivalent of that. I, I will say the one thing that I will do to make it sound more like a console for me is I, I like to put the, the uh, UAD ATR-102 on the stereo bus and there's a crosstalk feature. And yep. so I, you know, and, and, and I find just, regardless of whatever the tape emulation is doing, just having the little bit of the crosstalk helps it feel more analog to me. Yeah, well, tape really emulation is along that same line. Yeah. I mean, my stereo bus, I do tend, I always have VCC as the first thing on the stereo bus, like Brad is saying, and I usually have a tape emulation of some sort, although not always that, that sort of project by project, but, but I do like the idea of sort of making it, Look, uh, and I know Brad's also a Raven user. I'm mixing on a Raven, and um, it, I, I like the idea of it having looking at it and having it feel like a console. It's like mm -hmm. yeah. everything's there. I'm not stopping and mousing around or setting it up. I, I, I also you like I like to keep my sense. You know, all the plates will be on two, and yes, 480 will be on one, like a real like we used to have in the console. 
Yeah. People send me, you know, mixes and, you know, the first channel is bus two on the top and then the next one is bus three on the top. It's like, what? It's just so hard to learn your way around the real estate instead of the way the console looks. Yeah, exactly. I have a question for you guys that I've, I noticed something I've, I've been doing recently, like on certain records where it's a, you know, it's a band record and it's sort of a consistent thing uh, from one song to the next. I find that I mix, I'll make it, I'll, I'll get sort of the sound of the record on the first one. Then I will just go off a template for each song. Oh yeah, on. absolutely. Yeah. Well, know, sort of I, I will do that if having listened to all the rough mix, the album has a unifying kind of, that, yeah, that, yeah. That, I mean, that, if the that, album's going to be very eclectic, that's not going to work, but yes, that, yeah, sure. Yeah. If they don't have to keep reinventing the drum sound, why would you? Right. Yeah, I right. find right. templates are definitely the way to go. I, I, oh, I, was, yeah. I was going to get to that. So let's get to that now. How do you use templates, you guys? Do you and how do you? I, I use templates all the time. I have my group set up. I have my master set up. Everything is muted in the template, so it's not on when it first comes up, so we're not right. hearing it. But then they just route the drums to the drum bus, route the keys to the keys bus, piano to the piano bus. And then, you know, generally you find yourself doing the same kinds of things to those kinds of instruments sure. over and over and over again. So you're just really saving yourself repetition. Yeah. So, yeah, I, re I rely on it heavily, absolutely. Yeah, I find that once I've imported all the set, the tracks into my template, I'm 75% of the way there. Mm -hmm. Like a lot yep. of the sounds and the effects and everything. And like you say, the groups, you know, parallel compression, all that is set. Yeah. And it's it's kind of, you know, I kind of stick with the same sort of things all the time. So the sound. Yeah, it's, it's like having an assistant, but, you know, it's, it's yep. the computer. Yeah, but I yeah. took the hours to create the template. I was the assistant. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yep. And it changes over time, right? You find yourself oh, yes. adding and subtracting things all the time. Yep. My one of my first templates had, you know, all different plugins all over the place. And now the yep. one is like I said, it's one channel strip for all the drums and yeah. all the vocals and you know, most of the guitar and right. Yeah, you I tend to you tend I, to move towards elegance if you can. That's yeah. the secret. Yeah, well if you do this a lot, anything that makes it simpler we find out pretty quickly is a good thing. Absolutely. And I, and I kind of find the things that I really like and I stick with them. I don't really try new things too often unless, yeah. unless I yeah. see something I'm like, oh, let's try that. And then it blows me away and I keep it. Well, yeah. part of that is I want to get it done quickly. I mean, most of us have moved to a per project fee. So I want to spend as little, I want to be able to do as many projects. I, I can't, I can't stretch things out and take two days to, to do a mix right. and do it by the hour, you know, so right. I'd rather get, you know, two mixes in a day rather than you know a mix every two days right and and uh and ex and sitting around experimenting <laughs> trying to figure something out rather than and i like to be very intuitive when i'm working in this, whether it's tracking it's like i just have an idea i think this will work i you know uh, bill and i have talked about this there was a thing in the 90s that there was a trend that like you have to go through each eq and each mic pre and see which one sounds the best <laughs> these were guys billing by the hour by the way right. yeah, um, you no know, there's the famous guy that tried every 57 on the guitar amp at the studio see i already know the answer Probably to the which 57 time. to use because i wouldn't be caught dead using a 57 <laughs> on anything ever maybe as a hammer maybe yeah. as a hammer yeah hang in a picture yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've actually Sweet. broken a 57 once that which which I didn't think was possible. I consider the you having done a service to humanity. <laughs> and Bill, how come when I started with with you and Cindy, she was singing into that 57? Why did yeah, you Yeah, but it, you, this is a whole other first of all not my doing, but, but that was a whole other rat's nest of, you know, stories know. of people telling her what you know, but sure it was sure basically trying to snow her about what she was singing into. It didn't last uh, very long though. I must no. have the right thing and that was it. Yes. So we have a question, I guess, from the chat talking about uh, stereo assignment. Um, I guess they're asking two things. I think they're asking about stereo placement. Uh, you know, there's always the argument about uh, pan positions versus hard left, right, center mixing. And I guess also a question here about mixing from mono or mix from stereo. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, let's talk about uh, left, right, center 
mixing. I am one of those. I never put anything anywhere but left, right, or center people. Or wow. almost never. That's well. That's like from real old consoles where they. Yeah, exactly. Have- I love a desk that has left, right switching. I don't need pan pots except yeah. <laughs> once yeah. the moon. Uh, how about you guys? Well, I try to put things in like nine and three or ten and two, and I end up. I end up Widen, left widen right. them out. Yeah, I yeah, just think it's a wank. Yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll go to nine and three. Sometimes it depends, but. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why. If something feels out of balance, or if if I want something up the center, and I but it's it feels like something else is occluding it, and I'm just trying to separate it a little bit. The only reason that I will go a little bit off to one side is because then I feel like I get some separation. Uh, maybe, I just think that's an illusion, though. Well, it, that's it may, the thing. It may be psychoacoustic. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. But yeah. like, in, in terms of, uh, you know. My, Oh, if this is kind of what the questioner was saying, uh, you should always check your mixes in mono because yeah, you have to collapse them at yeah. some point. I don't know sense. if that was the question, but I think that's an important point. Yes, yeah, you always have to do that. Yeah, I've gotten and, and and I'll say also, I'm a firm believer. Mono means one speaker. That if you're listening, you're checking in mono in the center of your stereo image. You're still fooling yourself because any slight differences between the two are spreading the clarity a little bit. Yeah, which is why yeah. the old Neve consoles mono is out of one speaker. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Or listen on the tape machine, the little speaker on the tape exactly. machine. Exactly. We were talking about that online the other day. I love that. It's a little, little way, that was higher the on the studio. Or the, the, yeah. Yeah. Those were the secrets of the older guys. You know, yeah. the younger guys want to hear the big soffit mounts, and then the, the older yeah. guy would be like, mm-hmm. No. Hey, staying alive mixed on aura tones. <laughs> that explains yeah. a lot. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever seen Criteria B? It's about the size of the room my bedroom that i'm in right now it's really tiny right. mm-hmm. the whole the whole saturday night fever was recorded in it's very very yeah. small studio a- and mixed on an mci which shows you can surmount any obstacle yeah right <laughs> it's, the, it's the samurai not the sword <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so uh, let's talk about um your master bus Brad talked about maybe putting VCC on it. Are you guys, uh, the current phrase is top down. Do you have a lot of stuff on the master or do you tend to be more about individual channels and not much going on in the master? Is there a go-to set up on your master fader? Uh, I guess I'll start with this. I do have, I do have several things on my master, which I'm, you know, turn off, turn on at, at times to see if it's doing what I need it to do. Sure. It's pretty much always, I'm, I always, have the Brainworks Digital V3 Imager on there. That's something that just lives on there. The ATR 102 tape machine mm-hmm. lives on there, and Shadow Hills Master Bus Compressor seems to live on there as well. Those are like three things that are they never leave it really. Mm-hmm. Fatso sometimes and some other EQ oh, wow. maybe, but so yeah, I guess I got a few things on it. But it's it's little things. Each one does yeah. something tiny. But- like, I can but you're mixing off. through that. You're mixing through that all the time. Or are you putting it on somewhere in the process? No, I'm going to start with it on. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Start with it off. Yep. Start with off. I put the SSL comp at the end because I grew up on SSL, so I'm familiar with the that bus compression. Then a tape emulation if I need it. A little bit of a widener. I've been bouncing around between uh, DMG audio and Isotope and different ones. You know, just a little spreader if you feel like you need it the waves s1 a lot of times i just turn it on and go nah it's not better turn it yeah. off Sometimes and then a limiter at the end if i'm gonna if i'm gonna send it to a client and it has to have a little oomph right if you're feeding the loudness war yeah, yeah. i see this is what i love is you know someone will come in to use my room and they will use the exact same gear that i use and do something i would never think of doing and uh-huh. it still sounds great and this is mm-hmm. you know we uh, i i I start without anything on just to sort of get my sounds. But then when I start getting my levels I, 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 is when I, when I put it on, I, I always put the ATR 102 and what I, and because I like to go through outboard uh, when I print, I'm using, when I'm mixing, I'm using the uh, UAD equivalent of my outboard just to give me the overall vibe. And I find that it translates really well that when I print. So if I use the SSL, uh, on my stereo bus, then I use the obsidian and I'm doing like one and a half dB of compression on the yeah. end. It's going to give me pretty much the same thing. And then I'm, and, and then I'm 
sort of fi fine tuning, you know, to that sound I want out of that thing, just that little bit of squish. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, I use, I'll also use a, a manly very moo on not so much for the compression, but just for the flavor. I just mm -hmm. try to get it to sound more whatever we think analog is. Right. Uh, but that, but I pretty much have a standard thing, but what I will do on the 102, depending on how much, uh, I find myself futzing with the bias knob frequently, um, <laughs> because, because, you know, the, the, the more I bias, the darker it gets in a way that an EQ won't do it. It just mm -hmm. makes it a little muddier in a way that went for certain people who are like, I want this to sound more analog, which usually to them means yeah, I want it to sound woolier, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I find just cranking the bias up just a little bit gives it that woolly sound in a way that's different than, than you know, putting uh, a low pass filter on or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. that make, any, makes sense. To sure, that, yeah, sure, that. But you, when now when you say the very mu, that's also hardware you're talking about, not an emulation, right? Well, when I print, when I print it, I go through the hardware. You do the, I, go through the hardware, and what does that do to your recallability? I, it's uh, because I what I well, what I do is in my because one thing I love about Pro Tools is the comment section. So yeah. so I just the best know, thing I, I hate about YouTube. <laughs> and, 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 exactly and 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 very similar like whenever i do a vocal session or certain things if i think there's going to be an overdub uh in the comment section when i'm when i'm doing a session i'm like what mm -hmm. mic is it what uh what polar possession is, is it what pre what do you, you know what compressor what what are the settings on so everything's recallable in that way and the same thing when i print a mix um, everything, uh, everything goes in the comment section. I'm going through this, here's the settings, you know, and typically it's something with detents too. So it makes it easy. Correct. So, um, you know, just like what good mastering guys should do, which is take notes. And unfortunately some of them don't. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I've never, I, I, I've, I've managed to avoid ever having a mastering guy not have notes. But... Yeah. Well, there's, that's a story we'll talk about off camera. Okay. <laughs> So just to complete the picture for what it's worth, I tend to, I always will have VCC on the master and usually followed by whatever compressor of choices working on the album I'm working on. Um, I will sometimes do hybrid and use my actual audio and design complex hardware because I've just made a hundred thousand records with that. And to me, that's just the sound in my head. And that's but hard if, to emulate that thing. There is one, the uh, 10 dB or Boz, that company makes one. It's okay. It's not, why? But it's good. But um, I will often use one of the Slate uh, virtual bus compressors. That those work really well for me. Um, right. um, and then I have usually a Brainworks EQ. I use the hybrid V2, uh, and then some sort of tape emulation. And a lot of times I've been using this kind of interesting plugin. You guys know about this Frindle Dynamic Spectrum Mapper? It's a plugin alliance. Yes. Paul, is that Paul Frindle? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, what it is technically I if I dare use that word is a very 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 multi-band compressor it's like 100 bands or some ridiculous thing but it functions essentially as an EQ because it's so many bands that you you can shoot the curve capture the curve of the mix and it locks it in in compression so that it's constantly readjusting to keep that EQ curve basically steady. So using just a bit of that makes the mix for me just sort of hang. Uh, it makes yeah. the color hang in a particular yeah. place with it, without something getting pokey every once in a while. I think I recall when he was working on that, because I think he was working on it maybe when he was at Oxford. But are you are you able to analyze another sound and have it? Yes, come? yes, you could. I mean, you know, it's yeah, you, I yeah, guess I suppose you could try to EQ match with it, too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how well that works as effectively, although I will have a curve that's sort of my favorite curve. I might not necessarily take it from the mix itself if I want to a little more heavy handedly impose a, a, a character. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't I wouldn't try to shoot back in black and, you know, make my folk record sound like that. Yeah. Right. But I could see it being handy if you have vocal takes from different mics or something it is good for that i have done that if if you it's even better i find if you've got for example a verse that sounds really good and when it gets to the chorus the vocal gets a little screechy you can capture the curve of the verse and force it on the chorus pretty effectively 
which anyway, is that's to show you that half of what we do is not getting things to sound good. It's getting them to not sound bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Well, right. I mean, but Problem that, solving. but that's true. I mean, fixing the things that really need to be fixed is a big part of the job as opposed to just deciding ahead of time where you're going to manipulate everything. Yeah. Because some things are okay if they're not quite perfect because human. human Absolutely. Oh, no, man. Look, Things yeah, a little pitchy. Yeah. Don't bother me if the perform if the performance is there. Leave it totally. alone. Totally, mm -hmm. totally. And and everything we do should be about amplifying that performance. About making that emotional connection. I always say, is it making you dance? Is it making you cry? Is it making you laugh? Is it making you yeah. sing? That's what matters. Not not you know the engineers are listening for the you know yeah. is that seventy percent to the left. The fewer mistakes that were on Rolling Stones records, the less interesting they sounded. <laughs> yeah, maybe, right. But, it, but cer certainly an absence of mistakes is not what makes a record interesting. I always talk to my clients about making their record attractive to their audience somehow. Yeah. It's got to be attractive. If it's hip hop, it's got to attract the hip hop audience. Yeah. What does that mean? So, you know, we don't have to tune everything. We don't have to line everybody up. We have to make the record attractive. That's the goal. Yeah, I think less experienced people, at a, it, it's a kind of a fear, you know, there's, there's the imaginary parent behind them going, that vocal's not exactly into, other people are going to listen and say, you're a bad producer because that vocal's not 100% into. Well, Dave just brought up something, and this is an interesting philosophical question. I mean, I always tell people, I'm like, look, I'm sure till the day he died, David Bowie heard something on Ziggy Stardust that he wanted to change, and we think it's perfect, you know, but yeah. I, 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 I don't know. Did. I, I, I'm, I'm doing a record with a very, you know, legendary artist who was trying a track with a, 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 a not, you know, with, with, with a very established big hip hop producer. And we got all these things and it seemed that, um, the, you know, the producer had his guy come in and they did all these parts. And, and, I, and I think there's something because in hip hop, they're so used to working with samples, they don't mind, they've overlooked all the rubs. They've heard mm -hmm. all these things working against mm -hmm. each other and no one, and, and no, and, and then this person, you know, the, the artist who has a very good ear was hearing all these things working against each other. Like, no, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. And I think he's right as a musician, but sometimes I have to go like, like Dave was saying, who's the audience? What are they, you know, like, who am I, who, who am I making this music for? Do they really care about this or that? Right. You know, is, right. is it, uh, and 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 sometimes that has that that's a, a sort of a philosophical discussion that needs to be had with the artist. I think I, I don't know my, what that has to do with mixing the box. One of my one of my favorite <laughs> things to do is is to play Louis Louis for my my clients, where the guy comes in four bars early at the end of the guitar solo. Yeah, like the first, yeah, yeah. The first word of the verse. And yeah, I never heard that before. I'm mm -hmm. like, how many bars have you been in and heard this record? Thousands. You yeah. never heard that guy come in early, but there he is. Yeah. I always like to point out the spot in Satisfaction where Keith Richards forgets to step on the fuzz pedal to when the riff comes back in. You're the there, like there's, right. The there's a million of those we love. I, 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 I like to talk, uh, uh, to me, the classic one is um, at the end of the solo in Any Time at All, the Beatles record, where the piano went up to the suspended four and the guitar didn't and, 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 and it was a, a, like a beautiful rub. And then they fixed it on the reissues. And I hate the fixed version. Yeah. It's like there's, you just, you know, what you were talking about, JJ, that you just, you know, yes, it's a rub. Musically, it's wrong. They're making a second they didn't mean to make. But so what? You know, so it's what? like, yeah, that, that, band, that, that band's never going to make it with that fucking mistake. You guys have the multi tracks for uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine? No. It, 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 it's, some guys are playing minor and some guys are playing major uh -huh, right? uh -huh. over, over the thing. It's like, mm -hmm. and, it, and you know, this is the type of thing you'd beat somebody up in a uh, band practice over. And, yeah. and, and, you know, it's like, no man, it's major. Yeah. But you're singing a minor third, you know, whatever. It just, it works for some reason. Yeah. It's so yep. weird. Exactly. But, but somebody has got to be smart enough to say, no, that's the take that worked because yeah. again, yeah, I'm dancing, I'm crying, I'm laughing, whatever it was, that's mm -hmm. what mattered. Oh, that person yeah. must be the producer. There's a novel idea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what do you guys like to have sent to you if you're being asked to mix somebody's record? Let's assume, let's assume 
let's not get into is it in Pro Tools or is it not in Pro Tools? I mean, I'm not talking about how the files are, but I'm talking about do you like to get, if you can, do you want people's sessions so you can have their plugins and see what they're doing? Or do you want just raw tracks and you're going to start from scratch like it's a 24 track tape? I like to see the plugins just to see where they were. If I have, you know, if I have the similar. Yeah, that's how I feel. Kinds of plugins, at least, you know, at least listen or send me the rough so I can at least hear what you were doing. Well, for sure. You you don't want to spend a whole day going into left field. This is thinking it's great. And then you get the email the next morning like, uh, you know, uh, I'd rather I'd rather just go down the path they were on and make it better. Bring it, you know, bring it to life. That's, a, <clears throat> that's how I feel. I feel I can always turn off your EQ or replace it if I don't like what you did, but I might as well see and hear what it is in case right. it's out, I don't need to reinvent that wheel if it's fine. Right. It's work that's already been done. Yeah, I would like to see what they've done. and But sometimes they can't seem to send me a session and get the plugins in there for some reason. And, and, I've, and I'll just open it up thinking, oh, the plugins are there and they're not. And I'm like, hey, I didn't get any plugins, and I, I'm just going to do my thing, and then I'll do my thing and send it back to them, and they're fine. So that's weird, though. I wonder why that is. I don't okay. know, and and it doesn't really bother me, because I'm going to sit there and just listen to the tracks and create my own sort of vision right away off of what I hear, mm-hmm. and then I'll just do my thing. And fortunately for me, a lot of times my vision is kind of the direction they saw, and it's a good yeah. thing. You know, I have some very strong feelings about this. Good. <laughs> One is I hate when someone goes, make it sound like the rough mix, but better. But I'm like, then just use the rough mix. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, and, yeah. and, and, and I hate chasing rough mixes. But then when someone says, make it sound like the rough mix, and it's just horrible, and there's nothing about that rough mix that sounds good to me. Well, that's different. That, yeah. um, I, I tell people, look, if there's a plug-in sound you need, print it because uh, I, I don't there's a certain companies I just don't use their plugins I don't want to be in their stupid subscription model or whatever and not even tied right no no just I, joking I, sorry just for Tony <laughs> um, but uh, uh, no but uh, yeah it's a different one that I think we all get annoyed with over the last 30 years or 20 years that um, so uh, but what's really annoying for me is having first off i say i say that the the uh, the in out that the io setup is the new uh the new uh tape alignment you know every time i get a session first thing mm-hmm. i have to do is go into the io setup and change everything to work with my right. with my with my AD, uh, ad converters um i get so annoyed when people send me a session and it still has automation because I try to make, I try to move a fader and it snaps back. And, and then there'll be like three layers of hidden automation of pans and mutes and I'm driving around. And so uh, I, I was bitching about this to Ryan Hewitt and Ryan sent me the thing that he sends to, sends to everyone where he actually threatens a, a setup fee if they send him a bunch of crap. <laughs> but um, you know, he's working enough that he can do that. I'm, I'm not Ryan these days. So uh, but I just ask people, it's like, look, don't make this harder for me. Uh, and yeah, I don't like having to go through and, and, and clear up plugins. And, and most of them, are, people are using that company and I, I, I don't have it anyway, so I can't see what they're doing. <laughs> so just send me, just send me, if, 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 if you have a specific sound, send me one clean one and then print one with that sound on it. So I know this is what you want. It's funny. I guess I'm a little the other way. I have a thousand, not literally, but maybe literally, I have a thousand plugins that I almost never use, but almost anything somebody sends me, it's going to open. I'm going to have it, you know, and and to me, that makes my life easier that I can say, oh, they have a flanger popping on in the chorus. What is it doing? You know, whatever it is, I don't want to have to be chasing that information and I don't want to be locked into it necessarily. So, Having having it open here is the easiest way for me. Yeah. Well, At least a great, point, great point about the automation, man. I hate fighting automation. Yeah, everybody. When you that. when you were on analog consoles, you didn't put the automation on until nine thirty at night, right? Well, and, were, well, and you'd never start with somebody else's automation on the analog console. Well, yeah, but be, <laughs> why did you turn it on earlier? Because it was fighting you. You might make a decision yeah. to change, and yeah. now you're fighting automation. So mm-hmm. that's that's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a good part of my mixes are static balances anyway. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I think the better the mix is, the less automation I have to do. There's some things you're going to automate, but not 
65 things, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and I tend to get sessions sent to me where every track has automation, even if they're not moving it, they've written it as a static automation that you have to find. Right. You know, I try to do as little as possible automation wise. I don't know if it's because I'm lazy, but it's just, I, I'll which is a perfectly good reason, which, but I'll put something up and I go, God, that sounds good. And I'll get yeah. something really quickly, but then I'll keep listening. And this happened to a mix. I just did uh, last week. I was listening. And I'm like, this sounds good. But then I realized, okay, the chorus isn't popping enough. And then I went in and I'm like, okay, this needs to happen in the chorus more or something like that. And and rather than just going automation crazy, there has to be a reason that I'm I, exactly I'm automating to bring the mix to life rather than because exactly. To, that's a good way to put it and and I, I think you can fool yourself you can as you say automate like crazy and think you've solved the problem but it, you really should have solved the problem in the blend not right. yeah. not yeah i mean i mean there's the, there's the, you know there's the, some people who say like well you, you don't need to use a, a compressor on a vocal if you do the right automation it's like no you don't need to automate if you use the right compressor. <laughs> <laughs> well you were talking about the 70s stuff you know all those multi-tracks are circulating and when you open them up you put everything at you know zero and it sounds yes. like the record that's yes. on your jukebox. But well, but we had to. I was talking about this, I think, on another one of these podcasts that that you know, you used to have to come in every day, put up a quick balance in the monitor section and work and overdub and it had to sound like a record, like the record every the single record. time you did that, or you could really chase your tail. You know, it didn't do to just record a guitar that you find out a month later doesn't fit. So, so uh, that ability to have a quick static balance that sounds like the record is how we learn to make records. Yep, yep. yep. Get off my lawn. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> younger than you guys. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brad is the baby. Really? Oh yeah, I think so. No, I'm only 50. Mm. Well, I'm 58, so I'm not the baby. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm 83. Okay. I'm the oldest. Are you? I'm, I'm 67. I'm fine okay, with so, that. Okay, so am I. So okay, we don't, so we we don't know. Yeah. Well, Women that's right, the most we came, care, we came so. up with the same records. We talked about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what doesn't work for you mixing in the box? Or what do you wish you had or wish worked better? What do you miss? Just generally, what, 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 you, what would you like to see different? Or that you go, oh, fuck, I wish it did this. Uh, the steps walking up and down the console, the calories that the calories that you would burn <laughs> going down and grabbing those background vocals and then running over to the hi hat. <laughs> Technically I speaking, I can't think of much really. I, I, I'll will tell you one thing that I I'm, you know and and I've had to figure out ways to sort of replicate it, but it's not the same. There's certain consoles that you can push them, and it's just you get grind out of that mix, you yeah. know and and well that's the sort of thing things like vcc are trying to do and i think they do to at least a limited extent it's never going to be quite the same but yeah. i mean but, i know that's why that's why some people like like the dangerous uh some or, or something like that i don't know that that still quite does it, it it's no a, it, it's a different thing and i don't I mean, think chris's stuff is designed to be pushed either i mean you either think summing is better than working in the box or you don't but i don't think that's because you're going to push the well, offense, right. yeah. It's interesting. I'm I t I'm building this new room, and I and I bought a a, a Neve 5088 that's going to go in there. And and one of the things I'm in, when I install it, if we ever get this thing finished, that I'm interested in trying is, I, I really like the um the silk feature on the on on the the Shelfords. You know, you you can have either even or odd harmonic, and you can add the amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to be interested to see what the difference is in just running a stereo bus through the silk or running you know 12 individual channels through the silk and and if if i have to make my mixing process more of a pain in the ass to get a certain sound on certain records that's going to be mm. hopefully mm -hmm. i hope that i can do the laziest thing possible and not have exactly channels you know i could touch on that just a little bit because yeah. last year i mean this is coming from the live perspective i got on the yamaha rivage or rivage pm10 which has silk all over it went to Nashville to Blackbird specifically to get on the desk and see what it did. And I found that when I brought inputs up and just used silk, that I did less to think. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Right yeah. off the bat, when yeah. I could make something, I'm like, oh, let's see what silk does. Well, blue or red, oh, 
oh, that sounds great. Now I'll yeah. just do a little bit of something. And I was there. Mm -hmm. I thought silk was a really outstanding feature. Cool. Good to know. I thought it did something magical. Hmm. So we're getting another question to bring up. What does any does anybody have feelings about license protection, iLocks, software licensing, one way or the other? Anything you want to say? I'll I'll start. I'm not a hater of iLock. I know some people just hate it. To me, it's easy, and I sort of like not that I do it a lot, but I like the idea. I can grab my iLock, go someplace else, download the software, and it'll work there if I have to do a quick mm -hmm. overdub. Does Anybody have a feeling about copy protection, license protection in general? I, I'm, I'm fine with I hate people who steal things, so whatever you got to do to keep people from stealing stuff, I'm fine with. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with it as long as it works. I know I tried to download somebody's particular software, um, and I just, after hours and hours of trying to make it happen, I just couldn't, and I, I will just never buy anything from those people because yeah. it's just it's not worth the headache to me. No, no, nobody minds paying for the stuff. I'm not so big on the subscription thing, though, because, you know, you end up, you know, you're paying for Dropbox and Hightail and then all these plugins. And the next thing you know, you know, you have three, four hundred dollars of overhead in a month just to stay in one place. Yeah, I, I'll admit I, I have the Slate subscription, but that's the only one I think that I have. And, and I'm not. No, that's not true. I have the soft. Pro Tools, right? Well, I have a perpetual license and a support plan, but that sort of amounts yeah. to the same thing. Hey, Steve, if you're watching this, give give Whitman some uh, love there. <laughs> the package or Paul Wolf, one of you guys. But uh, yeah, I have. I, I also had the Sound Toys bundle. I uh, occurs to me that might be a subscription. I forgot if I I forgot if I bought it as a bundle or I paid by the month for it. So I guess I have a couple. I'm not unhappy the fifteen dollars a month for what the Slate bundle is. Mm -hmm. is fine for me. No, I have a lot of I have a lot of slate stuff, but not subscription. I bought. Yeah, you own it. Yeah, I Brad, you have a feeling about copy protection? Not really. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with the eye lock. It, you know, it works. I like the like you say. I like the fact that I can just stick it in my pocket and go somewhere. And yeah, yeah, exa exactly. Go to my laptop and get on it with whatever I need to do. Well, put it in your pocket if you have zero downtime. <laughs> so it doesn't, <laughs> yeah, doesn't fall right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, somebody's asking about something I guess we already touched on. Somebody says, um, if there was an article on, he says on Pro Tools experts suggesting, not mine, suggesting if you do not have a lot of automation, you're not building an exciting mix. But we've already said that. We basically feel that's not true, right? I mean, I feel it's that last little bit that you might need to do it. And if you, and and if you don't need to do it all the better. Just a tiny bit, you know, I yeah. automate my groups more than my individual phase. Yeah, exactly. I'll yeah. automate the master yeah. phase. If you have yeah. an exciting mix, maybe it's because the production's not exciting. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> do you need a different singer? Yeah. <laughs> it's not the mixer, it's the arranger. Yeah. So they play, hey, you, you, you played every note the exact same velocity. Gee, I wonder why this song goes nowhere. You know. <laughs> So how do you go, how do you guys feel about uh, would any of you use an assistant or do you pretty much set yourselves up do your own do you do your own prep work to set it up for your mixing do you do tuning beat detective that kind of stuff do you consider that part of mixing do you charge separately for that do you not do it go <laughs> I I would like to have an assistant once in a while but it's not enough to really pay somebody to work for me mm -hmm. like have him around all the time but sometimes you get albums that are in logic and need to be exported into pro tools and right. bounced in place or, or export audio whatever you can do and then set it up in my template and even get a rough balance if you, if the guy's that good and i've yeah. i've out, i've outsourced that a, a couple of friends who just you know dave if you have anything you want me to do I'll be oh that's you. a luxury you should shoot me those names <laughs> yeah, there's guys that would you know they love to do yeah. it. Yeah. So so that you know, but it's not a full time. Right. You can't keep them entertained all the time around the studio. I don't know that I want so in my home studio. I don't really want somebody. You know what I mean? It's bad yeah. enough. It's like <laughs> I don't need more people. But but it is a luxury to be able to you know those guys who have a full time. It goes beyond an assistant who are literally bouncing tracks down to enough faders to fit on their consoles and doing all the prep and the edits and the right. crossfades and all that stuff. It's great, but it's also a you know it's a major investment there. 
I, I have a wonderful assistant and I mean, where he really comes in handy is for tracking and cause he knows. Sure. Well, like, that's different. But, yeah. But when it, I'll, I'll tell him things like to set up my presets and things like that for me, but I sort of feel for a mix, I need to get my own uh, balance together um, just cause no one's going to hear it the way I am uh, on certain things. You know, we'll be working on certain records, and I know because his game is like when we're comping, he'll try to guess which one I'm gonna pick, mm -hmm. and so he kind of learned what I'm gonna hear. So mm -hmm. I know that I can I can let him do comps for me, which is great because there's that's nothing. a big thing. I don't know if I have ever, I don't that. think I've ever trusted anybody. Right, that's it. I don't think I ever even trusted John and Yellow to do that when he was my engineer. But well, there's but, certain things if I'm the producer and yeah. I'm the, I'm probably gonna want to do it, but when we're when I'm just engineering for another producer, I'm happy to let him do it. Or if it's right, sure. a commercial session or something, a TV session like that, where it's not where we're we're the, we're the artistic, not really music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But well, how about things? Video. How about things like clearing fields or or crossfades in and out at the beginnings of regions and stuff like or clips they call them now. Do you, you'd rather do that yourself? Would you ask your assistant to do that? It's. I don't I don't Good. have an assistant. So right. I'm doing myself. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on what it is and if he's here. You know, he's not here. Mm -hmm. for okay. Fair enough. And what about things like tuning and beat detective? Do we do we have religious feelings about getting involved in that stuff? I mean, I have to do it a lot, but only when the producer asks me to do it. I don't volunteer. Oh, we should tune her because she sounds awful. I, right. I wait till they say it sure. and then I, I do the technology. Sure. Well, that's just knowing what it's like to work with a producer, right? You, you know, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do stuff if I, if I feel it's necessary. If I hear something that really bothers me, then I'm going to fix it. Mm -hmm. But you guys consider that part of mixing or are you going to say, I'm going to charge extra if you want me to tune or? Uh, no, it's part, it's part of it, I think. Yeah, I think it's I part think of it. Are the, is the budget big enough to charge extra? For yeah, I, for me, it depends on how extensive it is. But I mean, I was handed something a little while ago, or not so, six or eight months ago, where it was like it, everything needed to be tuned. You know, it was like 10 tracks of vocals. Everything needed to be. It was it was days of that stuff. It was taking much more time than the actual mixing. There was no way I was going to do that for a flat fee. I, I think at that point, you need to charge extra for that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not, it's not really what I think. I it's not the thing you should be hiring me for. There are probably people that are better and faster, and that's all they do. It's like you yeah. know, not not the reason you called me. But well, I just did a project that had a guy like that in between me and the producer. There was a producer, yeah. an actual editor, like a flosser. He flossed everything up, and then I mixed, and then someone else mastered. It was very extensive, mm -hmm. extensive that kind of uh, separation of the jobs. Yeah. And did you like it? Was it good or was it in your way? No, it wasn't in my way. He was, he, he was excellent. He was in Seattle. So we had to keep schlepping files over the internet as he, oh, I heard something. I fixed it up. Import this track into your mix. You know, as, as the mix yeah, revisions cool. increase, it got more and more difficult. But, you know, he, yeah. he managed it well. It was good. Yeah. On a, on a really big project. That's why it's like having the full time assistant. I mean, if it actually yeah. is helping you, it's nice to yeah. have, be able to offload the busy work. Yeah, there are guys who get hired a lot just to tune. That yeah, that's what I mean. But if 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 you, if it's a heavy tuning thing, you should hire one of those guys. Yeah, and yeah, and there's also a thing I saw. I was watching a video with Chuck Ainley doing like some I don't know, it was some pop thing, and he was mentioning that the vocals go off to somebody for vocal treatment. And yeah, so they come back not just tuned, but they come back with. Oh, really? Is yeah. that true, or do you think that was a euphemism because he didn't want to say I have to tune I mean, her? It didn't seem like he was putting on. You know, it. It. In. It, 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 it. I was. I was really kind of intrigued by this, and and this is one of the things that always frustrates me about pop music. You know, when, when I'm not, I, I'm I'm more of like I I do bands. I like doing bands. I like you know, but pop is such a weird thing, and pop always has to follow trends. Yeah. And so there's always like lots of production tricks that people are doing in pop on any given day that you kind of have to be hip to. Yeah. And, and, and particularly it goes around vocals. You know, you'll have like a detuned vocal on your left going down, a detuned vocal on your right going up and the thing to get, you know, and it's, and it's, it's such a weird thing. Um, and the problem with trends is it'll sound dated in five years. 
Oh, not in five years, in six months. Well, whatever. Yeah. But, 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 you know, I, I, so that's why I thought maybe that's what this was. It's like, oh, here's someone who's like the trendsetter. Um, Could be. Um, for, for, you know, whatever the, the, the latest uh, uh, pop records uh, vocal sound is. I'm just glad we don't have to pay uh, royalties on the oral exciter on the vocals anymore. <laughs> yeah, remember that? And sign the paper that you wouldn't open the box up and see there was only one little board inside. Yeah, but it was potted. You couldn't see what was going on. <laughs> so uh, so the, what, about, what about deliverables? What do you guys deliver? This is always a little bit of, a, of an argument you can have. I mean, do you... Um, do you deliver your session with plugins and all? Do you give stems or do you just do, here's your stereo mix and a vocal up and an instrumental and a TV track? It's like, what, what do you guys deliver? I know it varies a little by the demand, but in general. Yeah. I generally try not to deliver stems, although record companies have now figured out that that's the tape for them. And they want, they want stems so they can just push up all the stems and have the mix. But that's, you know, it's hours of work. So I don't, I won't do it. I, I let the artist fight it out with the management. Yeah, I, I, me too. I, I'm opposed to it anyway. I don't yeah, want somebody don't want to say, game. you're just going to change one thing and call it my mix, or you're going to not hire me to do the mix again, whatever it is. It's like, if yeah. you want the mix, the mix is a stereo mix. Yeah. yeah. The only times I've done stems was when someone requested it because they needed certain elements for their live show. Uh, and I sure. That right. More, they pay, but they paid for that, right? Differently from the well, th this was a very dear friend that I was helping out, so I didn't charge. But they were paying me well for the record. But I just kind of, I don't remember if they gave me an extra fee for it or whatever. But it was like, here, I'll make you a yeah. stem. Of but also, in my case, when I've done that, it's like, well, here are the loops or the loops and a click or something that you or the and loops and the click in the background vocals or something you need for the live show. But I'm not giving you the drums and the lead vocals and everything that you can recreate. Yeah, the record. No. However, no I've worked with an artist where they wanted to, you know, part of their promotion was they wanted to be able to give stuff to a remixer to do like his remix thing. And in that situation, I did give stems. But why wouldn't you just give them the multi-track then? Because, because they're a remixer, not a mixer. They're more of a DJ, you know? Like they don't know how to mix. And that's just- That's your problem. You gotta, yeah, you gotta, <laughs> right. you know. Again, a good friend. I wasn't. I was. Yeah. I was happy to try to help them, and it didn't matter because the record went linoleum. So, right. <laughs> and how about how about level? Oh, Brad, do you have a feeling about that? You do yeah. stems for people? I, I'll do stems if they ask, you know. And I'll just do, you know, generally just send them a stereo mix. Yeah. And they seem to be happy with that. Coming from the live side of things, you know, with Enrique, and sometimes we'll do shows that are going to get mixed in post production. Sometimes I'll hand stem live stems off to Carlos, his producer, you know, so that it'll speed up his process in the end. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's, that's, that's nothing. That's space bar and the show goes. And it's already there. Yeah. Yeah. It's already yeah. Done. yeah. It's simple. And how about levels? What level do you guys deliver a mix at? Let's talk, just talking about your basic stereo mix that you're sending to mastering. What level are you sending? I try to leave three at the top of, you know, of, from the peak. Three from the peak. Because yeah. I think I'm a lot lower than that. I mean, I tend to aim for about minus 14 to minus 16, somewhere in that range, averaging. Are in you, the what, what, what are you viewing in? That's one. That's one. No, I'm viewing in WLM, but I'm talking about the, you know, yeah. the peak of the. I, I, right. But I'm saying you, that the, the meters are, are they, are they, because there's the different meter settings, which depends on what you're. So yeah. I think yeah. this is PBU I'm talking about. I, I used to with WLM as well, but, um, or or VLM, one of those two, but yeah. So yeah, so that in that yeah. case, it's fourteen or sixteen. You know, yeah, I try not to, I try not to get any harder than that. First of all, because I think again, the headroom sounds better. I don't want anything clipping, but also, despite the fact that I'm going to argue against them doing any limiting, it's I would rather <laughs> leave, I'd rather not tie the hands of a master. I mean, that's sure. part of these days, especially that's part of a big part of what mastering guys do is get a competitive level out of it, and you know, there's not much else. Which is my last question. What do you guys feel about mastering and, and you guys have a preference and how much input do you guys get into who masters your records? I mean, there's a bunch of guys around that we've been to that, I mean, some of them have recently passed away and, and we know all those Marino you brought up, Tom Coyne. There's a few guys around New York that, 
that I really love and I would trust them with anything. And then sometimes the client has their favorite and you, you may not agree with it, but you know, you, you don't really have any input into that situation. Yeah. I, I mean, I have an argument there. It's, 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 I don't, I don't give that up easily. You're not going to win every single time, obviously, but I, I feel strongly that if you want me to mix your record, you should go to one of the guys that I know right. knows how to translate, knows what I do and knows how it works and isn't yes. going to, isn't going to say, gee, I wish you mixed it this other way. Right. Um, you know, now that George is gone, it's pretty much going to be Greg Calby or Ryan Smith's both Sterling guys for me. But yeah. You guys. I, I, I'll, uh, I like to get my mixes to a point where the mastering guy has to do very, very little. Yeah, of preferably course. nothing. And, nothing. And, 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 and so when I hear their work, I get annoyed. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't want, I don't want the mastering guy to have a strong opinion. And, and, and I know mastering guys who have very strong opinions, which I happen to disagree with too. So I've only put my foot down once when someone said they wanted to use someone. And I was like, absolutely no way. Mm -hmm. um, and then I recently, just because of there's other experiences that, you know, like I said, someone who doesn't take notes, I won't use them for that reason. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, because I mean, we just went through this, you know, like every revision came back sounding different. We're like, yeah, that's that? weird. Very, very, very famous entering, uh, mastering guy. And, and it's just, it's mind boggling. But I, that you know, really is in that world in particular. It's so all yeah, about. It's so high end. Yeah. We call yeah. That, yeah. Those guys were doing recalls before anybody else did. I mean, yeah, but I, yeah. I, I like, you know, I like someone who does, it's like, oh, okay, you took half a dB out at 400 and it sounds a little cleaner and I'm fine with that. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to hear that you added like a dB at 600 and now my horn section's louder. I didn't want yeah. to. Nobody would, nobody ever objects, I think, if it comes back and you go, well, wow, that made it 5% better. I mean, if it's, but, but that's, it comes back to, I want somebody who understands what I hear. And, you know, George Marino always went right to the frequencies he knew I was going to want. I'm sure it's not the thing he would have done if another producer walked in the door, another mixer walked in the door, even with the same record that they were going to be, well, probably not because it's already what's on tape. But, but the point is he knew what was going to be a little more, a little less in a particular area, what were going to be the areas that are comfortable for me. He knows what I'm already starting to try to get. And I agree with you, the, the, you know, the less you have to do in mastering, the more successful I think yeah. that is. One of, the guy, one of the guys I really like is Mark Wilder at Battery, and he's, he calls it a little kiss. Dave, I just gave it a little kiss. It was well, fine. he better buy me a drink first. <laughs> that is kind of what you want. <laughs> but yeah, but you get it back and it sounds like what you thought, but somehow it's a little, like you say, 5% better. Okay, good. I'm good with that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like to, when I'm done with it, I, I feel that it's almost there. Should be. You know, yeah, this, sure. this is what, this is my representation. And all you have to do is maybe tiny bit of air or a little bit of limiting or whatever, make it a little bit louder. That should be all you have to do. Yeah. yeah. If it's not, if it's not 95% or hundred percent there, then I'm not done. It's exactly. like, <laughs> why, why would I send it to mastering going, well, the drums suck. I hope you can fix it. Right. Right. Because because we all know that doesn't work. You were part of my discussion recently about doing car checks. You know, part yeah. of the reason I do a car check is because I want to give the mastering guy less to do, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, and that's where like when I, there are certain things about civilian speakers that like, it's like some, oh, it's always somewhere around a hundred to 200 Hertz. If there's like, I won't bug my studio speakers, but it'll just start farting in the car. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and I, it's really important for me to know how it translates and not hope that the uh, mastering guy can intuit how it's going to translate on something else. You know? mm -hmm. But again, those really good guys are supposed to know that stuff. You know, it's like I, I shouldn't have to second guess them or I, or if I have to second guess the mastering guy, we're really at the wrong <laughs> place. <laughs> I don't know. I, in, in that discussion, I just said, I, I used to do all that stuff as I've got older and crankier. I just, I know my speakers. I know how it translates. I don't, I don't, I don't use more than one set of speakers. I don't check anywhere else. I don't listen outside the studio when I'm working most of the time. It's like, I just, I, mm, what it sounds like here is what I care about because I know what that's going to do. Right. And, and, and that tends to be true. Even you're if you're I'm traveling, I cut to wax. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, thank you, you guys. I think that probably covers everything except for Stuart Lerman's snotty comedy. He says, what do you wear when you're mixing in the box? Um, I, wear, I wear no pants just like right now. Your bathing suits. <laughs> yeah. Probably a Western shirt. You're well, it goes without saying, right? <laughs> and Nico wears a tie. <laughs> Very important. Well, thank you, guys. I think this has been great. And it's good to see all of you. Everybody. Yeah, you time. too. It's been really fun. It's in the nice time of play. Yeah, it's been great. Love okay. Really good. Stay in touch, you guys. And, and thanks a Everybody lot. Everybody stay healthy. Yeah. Stay for sure. See you when they let us out. Exactly. <laughs> Take okay. care. Bye-bye then.